seat. Uh, Hello. Thank you. You're such a kind audience. We haven't even done anything to deserve that yet. So thank you very much. Glad you're here. I'm Robert McBride. Much more importantly, this is Clemens Schult, our guest conductor tonight, making his Oregon Symphony debut. And we have a program tonight of music by composers who could have lived longer. Lily Boulanger made it into her 20s, Felix Mendelssohn into his 30s, Schumann into his 40s, but at least they made good use of their time and, and we get to benefit thereby. I'm pretty sure tonight will be the first time I've ever heard anything by Lily Boulanger other than on a recording. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's actually also my first time to play or to conduct the, the first um, piece. I've conducted the, um, the happy one, uh -huh. the second one. They are very much combined to each other, actually. But you're right, they are, they are not very often played. And part of the problem is actually the very bad edition, that there's not a proper edition you can actually get. It's, it's full of mistakes and full of, you know, you, we really had to make research I a lot. I thought her sister would have fixed all that. Yeah. but. Because she did, there are many contradictions. Because um, Lily was, I mean, she, she composed it in her last year, the, the, two, the two pieces, and she would cross out things and would write things again, and then um, her sister would correct this again. So the score, I, I really saw the handwriting, it's, it's really a mess. And there are editions that you can buy that had to decide for a version, but still they are full of mistakes and still full of questions. And actually you will hear a kind of premiere like the Oregon version, which is a, a combination of uh, the fine ears of the musician that spotted a really maybe some little wrong note in the second bassoon or something that I didn't discover even. But also my decisions, what I think is best for the piece. Wonderful, thank you for sharing that with us. I had not heard in either of these pieces until this afternoon, and the thing that really struck me about the first one is, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a dirge, it's like a requiem, this, this rhythm that just won't stop, like dragging us to the grave, my goodness. And then, and then the second piece, uh, much happier. That kind of reminded me of Schumann, where he has those two extremes in his life and, and in his music. Did that have anything to do with you pairing these? Well, ab absolutely. Actually, I had the same thought. I also thought it's a kind of funeral uh, march. I had also the, the, the f image in my head for uh, like a procession, someone who's walking towards an endless road and leading to some somewhat kind of, yeah, very tragic. But what is really important, and I'm not sure that everyone in the audience could, Im um, could immediately hear it, but this, it's the same melody. The, the two pieces have the same uh, notes going. Um, maybe I can just, just sing it. I have a, ba have a ba very bad voice, but it's this da di da da da. This little melody comes in the first movement. Dim, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. This kind of walking. And then ding, da dum, da di, da dum, da in, uh, in the second. Uh, so they're actually very closely combined, these two pieces. Of course, also the, the titles, a sad evening, and then the matta, the, the morning in spring. So maybe it's a, it's maybe also a kind of a nightmare, and then you wake up and you hear birds um, from your window and hoping that it's not being so bad. The world. Lily Boulanger had some kind of terrible fever when she was really young, and that damaged her immune system, and she was never healthy, and had what might be diagnosed now as Crohn's disease, some kind of digestive thing, and. Uh, may well have known that she didn't have very long to live when she wrote these pieces, I don't know. Uh, she was so well positioned in, in the Paris Conservatory with, with family on the faculty and her sister, Nadia Boulanger, studying there and she started tagging along when she was this tiny little kid going to classes and 
And it was Gabrielle Foure who noticed when this kid was only two years old that she had perfect pitch. So she had everything. She had the talent. She had the environment. Everything except her health. Yeah, isn't that sad? It's sad. But it's, it's such a treasure that we can listen to the, those pieces that she gave us just a few months before she died. This is really touching. So, um, I mean, there are other composers that didn't have, as you said, <laughs> didn't have a long life. I mean, what, have, what would have Mozart written or, or even Schubert? They all had these, these illnesses that probably nowadays would be uh, very easy to solve. So we are actually living in a, in a very good time concerning medicine. Um, and I, I can't think of, and I don't want to think of what, what other pieces would have been here. Um, but the, actually the elder sister, um, Boulanger, she, she was actually a, a famous conductor at that time. And I just learned that she also conducted the New York Philharmonic and the Boston and the Philadelphia Orchestra at that time, wow. like 100 years ago. And so uh, at that time, little Lily was really the, the, the little sister and just kind of trying to be as uh, mature and popular um, as her elder sister. And Nadia did some composing too, but she decided she wasn't really gifted enough in that way to focus on that. So conducting, and then she became the most revered, probably, uh, teacher of composers in the world, especially American composers, from Copland to Philip Glass, traipsed off to Paris to study with her. A few years wasn't, ago... Wasn't it Gershwin as well? I don't Did, think don't Gershwin. You, think, you don't think? I don't think so, but I could the be The American and Paris, I thought that could be a link could be. to her as well. I've been wrong about a whole bunch of things, so no, let's, I could be wrong, but let's look that up. Let's, let's look it up. You know, turn your phone off for the concert, but if you want to look that up right now, <laughs> you, you could do that. Who is the quickest? <laughs> Yeah, a couple of years ago, Philip Glass wrote a book about his life called Words Without Music, perfect title, and the best chapter is about studying with Nadia Boulanger. I had always wondered what it would be like to study with that woman. Read that chapter, you'll find out what it was like. It was not easy. Uh, very, very much about the basics. Bach, you're gonna play this chorale, and you're gonna sing this part while you play the other parts, and that kind of thing. Uh, it was a very interesting read. I, I love connections, relationships, the, you know, Lily, Boulanger, and Nadia, and Foré, and Copeland, and all these things. And then Mendelssohn and Schumann, you know, uh, Mendelssohn, whose first piano concerto we'll hear tonight, conducted the first performance of the Schumann Symphony we'll hear tonight. And Clara Schumann had this concerto in her repertoire. And these, and these people knew and loved each other and learned from each other. And, and, and that just keeps going. It keeps being carried on by people like you and orchestras like this. And I don't know. It just makes me feel grateful. Yeah. And it makes, it makes it alive it ma for, for me. It makes, a, it makes music... Um, history, not, not a, a, like a dry bread, we call it in Germany. <laughs> so, I like that. <laughs> that like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really lively. And, or for example, for me, just personally, um, the piano concerto um, was finished and the orchestration was finished in the town I just live in. It's in Munich. So Mendelssohn wrote when he was 27, uh, 22, I think. Um, he wrote it in, in Italy. Um, and then he, he went to, to Munich and also the first performance was in Munich and this is where I live. So, so we have also, it, until today, we have, we have, uh, we, I have a connection to these. And actually Mendelssohn and Schumann is, are one of my favorite composers. Uh, two of your favorite composers. Uh, just last week on this stage we heard Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. The rhythm that is also in this piano concerto that mm -hmm. can't be a coincidence, right? Mendelssohn has to be. Ba -da -da -da. Interesting. I don't know. It's the, you, you, you're, you think of the last movement. Yeah. Ba -ba -ba -da -da. Well, but this, these rhythms are, are so typical for, for so many. And um, I mean, if, if you see other movement, movements by Beethoven, bom, ba -bom, da -da 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 -da, the, the, the slow movement of Eroica, so many before and after him used it, but maybe 
the quotation, I mean, the, it, what struck me, um, Mendelssohn didn't have that much of a problem with Beethoven behind him. Schumann, I mean Brahms was, was really terrified of writing anything after Beethoven. Schumann uh, was w very long, he was waiting to write an orchestra piece because maybe of the respect to Beethoven and Beethoven Fifth Symphony, what you just said, but in the end, the, the first symphony that he wrote, it seems for me like he was writing it in two weeks on a summer breeze. Right. And it, it doesn't have this kind of elaboration and a work that Brahms tried like to reach Beethoven. Um, for, for me, Schumann was in, a, in just, maybe he was in this uh, Floristan mood, like in this posit positive mood. And so he didn't have to think about this Beethoven shadow. But I, I like your thought. Um, maybe I will conduct now the third movement of the Mendelssohn differently. Well, I hope I don't distract you. <laughs> Do you know if Stephen Huff will play an encore? If we applaud enough, will he play an encore after the Mendelssohn? Um, he did yesterday. Okay. <laughs> so please, I mean, he, he, he played a wonderful encore. He's, he's a legend. He's right. such an amazing pianist. So um, it's, it's worth applauding, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's true. <laughs> So you mentioned Floristan, so th this leads us into Schumann's fanciful self-portraits. Tell us more. He had, he had two, well he may be, by our standards, he might have been diagnosed as manic depressive. There's aspects of that in his behavior and he did die in an asylum. Uh, but tell us about his self-portraits. Floristan and you, how do you say the other one? Eusebius, Floristan and Eusebius. Eusebius. And so these were the two souls that he, he wrote about inside of him, but then there was Meister Raro. This is uh, like a, a master of, um, what Raro is, uh, Vernunft. Um, it's a word, um, like it's, it's in the middle between, uh, it, it's the, yeah. So there's, there's, there were three? There's a moderating yes, personality yes, there's, in there too? There's a moderating oh, yeah. person. Like, um, and That's probably useful, huh? We could all, <laughs> yeah. all use it. But you know, in, at that time where he wrote the symphony, it wasn't, it was, he wasn't really in a bad shape. He was, he was still quite, um, quite under control, let's say. And, but it got really worse and worse um, in, in Düsseldorf um, when he wrote his third symphony, which is actually his last, and then, and then he got really ill, and that, that was a very, very sad time, and C Clara, his wife, then, and he had many kids, that must have been very sad to see this enthusiastic person who was a writer, could write poetry, conductor, um, pianist, you know, he, he was such a figure in, in musical life, he was touring, and of course, Clara as well. I mean, they were both musicians on a, on a very very high standard. Um, that that's that's that also makes me very sad. Um, but on the other hand, the pieces that he wrote during his his illness, even in in this mental hospital where he went, um, they are so touching. They are cr really crazy, but in a way so yeah so personal um, and less less kind of perfect object objective, that's also um, yeah, a rare document actually of a composer going to a different yeah, region in his brain. <laughs> I think the two inner movements of the second symphony are wonderful self-portraits of Schumann. One of them is like most of this first symphony, it's just so ebullient and happy, but the slow movement is just incredibly tragic and so much so that that main theme just surges forward and it's carrying, it, carrying us with it and then it, it just dissolves mm -hmm. as though he couldn't maintain the thought. Oh, it's horrible, but it's wonderful too. Yeah. But that's in the second symphony, not tonight. The but but there's a... <laughs> Come back next week. Yeah, next, next time I'll do the second of oh, humor. please, please do. Uh, it's a good idea. Um, actually, Schumann is not very often, I mean, often played. It's, it, it's such a, a great symphony, uh, the four symphonies are, are amazing and I, and I was a violinist in my former time and I played all the four symphonies uh, on, on two nights just as, uh, after each other and it's, it's a great experience to play all four. Um, but um, 
what you said, this kind of climax and then this br break or this turning point, not to go to that climax, but to kind of have a relief or, or a different way. That is also in the end of the first movement. You will hear it's, it's crescendo and at the quickest possible and loudest um, um, moment of the symphony just before the end of, of, of the first movement. And then there's a little diminuendo. And then there comes this melody. Out of nothing. Clara, Clara. And maybe I think it's a really it's a hidden love song. Oh, I love that. Thank you. It could very well be. Do you happen to know why Clara Wieck, who became Clara Schumann, why her father so objected to that marriage? I, I don't know, maybe, maybe he saw some glimmer of later problems in the guy, I don't know. Yeah, it's, that's actually a good question. Um, I wish I could ask him, you know, so what, what yeah. was your problem, <laughs> dad? <laughs> um, I mean, it was, maybe it was, it was normal to to marry very early. I mean, Schumann, um, Robert met Clara when she was 12, I think, and they, they fell in love when she was 14, 15. And then actually, after, after he left the, the piano lesson and then he went to study um, uh, law, I think, um, he actually, Robert, uh, got um, engaged to another woman. It was just about the time where Clara wrote her Piano Concerto, which is an amazing piece, and I just discovered it and played it a few times with other orchestras. It's it's a great piece, but this it's actually an, I think a very very cute story. Um, so Robert was not married; he wasn't got married to, to this other person, but engaged. So Clara was a little bit um, angry about about Robert because, of course, they had written many letters, and so she 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 fell in love with another random cellist, also 20 years older than her. And the second movement of her piano concerto, you, can, you should actually listen to that. The it's cello solo. This cello solo of the piano concerto of Clara, written at the time when she was 15, 16 years old, where they were not together and Robert was engaged to this other woman, was a kind of piano sonata with a huge cello solo. So that was the middle, <laughs> the slow movement of Clara's piano concerto. And Robert, of, um, he, he instrumentated um, the first movement and the last movement then, when she was 16, 17, the last movement of Clara's piano concerto, then was all hers. But this whole combination of this piece is such a, such a, a book of stories at that time where, where Robert was at that house and went and then, and then they fell in love again. And um, well, but I, I can't tell you why why the father uh, didn't i think he was he he wanted some rich person yeah. to support the career of clara that's and what i was not, thinking too and not another artist yeah, right. <laughs> some, some rich prince <laughs> yes or something not yeah. some guy who plays the piano and doesn't play the piano as well as he used to tell us more about you you're where'd you, where were you born where did you grow up how old were you when you played the violin what made you want to become a conductor well, Actually, my father is a, a lawyer as well, not like Robert, but he is a hobby pianist. And actually, he wanted me to become a lawyer as well. <laughs> and but I decided I want to study violin. Um, and after a few years, it it was very obvious that I st spent more time studying scores and going into concerts, listening to rehearsals, going into the classes of conducting. Um, part of the problem was a little bit of my arm pain, which is, which is really strange because many, many of, our, of the artists, we are dependent on our bodies and, and everyone has a kind of neck problems or back problems and we're n nobody's talking about these things. But uh, for me, it was like opening doors because now uh, I had one year where I couldn't play the violin and I had time. I, I could read, I could go to, to, to Vienna to listen to concerts and I was actually 
for the violin a very sad time because I didn't touch it, but for me it was kind of the relief and it was great to, to, um, to find my, my actual way and I was much happier than I, uh, when I actually conducted. I, I called hundreds of friends, make, let's, make some, let's make a charity concert. And then they all came to the place where I lived, and we had a weekend of, of rehearsals and party, and then we made this huge cherry concert, and I was conducting, and that was it. And I really knew that's my way. And that was how long ago? Well, I think I was 26, 25. And now you're? 35, 36. Okay, all right. Ish. <laughs> well, you have a lot of youthful spirit about you. I, I love that. And, and doesn't he look young and handsome? And wow. I don't think he's available, though, judging from this, so, you know, but let's... You know what, my, my daughter's name is Clara. <laughs> Does she play the piano or the cello? Well, or? <laughs> She's one year old, so, oh. so it's a, that would be a prodigy, you know? Yeah, yeah, well, stay tuned, and find out what happens. What, what was the first piece you got to conduct? That would probably have been in a rehearsal or something, not in a concert or... Um, do you remember even? The very, very first piece was the overture of Magic Flute. But my first concert was um, a concert combined with classical music, Haydn, Mozart, and Schnittke, and some first performance of a friend that, who was a composer. Mm -hmm. And that actually is a kind of motto that stayed of the whole of my life until now, that I like to combine pieces that are well known from the classical romantic repertoire and some very unknown pieces. And uh, this is, this is uh, I don't think it's a coincidence. I, I actually, I really wanted that programming from the very beginning. Yeah, I, I totally support that. So how does your dad feel about your career now? Um, he's actually, he could have, or he would be a very good manager because he really knows exact, the exact date when I am where and he always looks on the internet about the reviews and so he's really enthusiastic and I mean he's 84 and I, I'm really happy for all, every year he's, he's yeah. with me uh -huh. and he can still travel a bit so I'm actually very glad when they come to a concert. Oh, sure. They're not here tonight from Germany but right. um, I'm, I, I'm sure he... Yeah, he knows the exact time when my concert starts. Right. It sounds like love to me. And acceptance. He's happy with you not yes. becoming a yeah, lawyer. Yeah, he's and that's okay. Both my parents are proud, yeah. yes. Either way, you know, there's so many lawyer jokes and so many conductor jokes. So either way... Tell me know, one, please. Oh, um, <laughs> oh dear, I shouldn't have gone there. How many conductors does it take to change a light bulb? Only one, he just stands there and holds it, and the whole world revolves around him. Yeah. Uh, lawyers, what's a good lawyer joke? I stopped telling those because my kidhood best friend is an attorney, and I thought it was disrespectful. Well, there's, you know, the, the usual, what do you call 10,000 lawyers at the bottom of the ocean? A good start. So there's, there's that one. I did stop telling viola jokes because they started seeming really mean to me and I love the viola. Yeah. You know, and especially you get a whole section, you get nine violas playing together. The sound is so beautiful. Mm. Is it your favorite instrument, the viola? No, I kind of have a thing for the oboe. I had an yeah. incredibly vivid dream once that I was playing the oboe. I could feel it in my hands, hear, hear my colleagues around me, I could see the auditorium and the conductor, and it was so vivid. I woke up thinking that I had been a blonde female German oboist in a, in a previous <laughs> life. The only thing that was weird and amorphous about that dream was the actual music, because you know how dreams are that way. It was kind of the Symphonie Fantastique, but not really. So it kind of came in and out of focus that way. But, oh, I love the sound. Of the oboe. You know what? I think in my next life I'm going to be a timpanist. Oh, that, I used to do that. I, mean, I love playing timpanist. I think y the timpanist always it, likes to flatter himself that he's the second conductor. Yeah, <laughs> but he, it, it is actually the the core or one of the cores of the um, the heart of the of the whole orchestra, and he can drive it and he can he can lead it to, and it's so dramatic. And I mean, my favorite bit is the Brahms Requiem, the second movement. Um, for example, but also in the sad evening, in the first piece we, d we, we will perform, uh, it's an amazing bit in the middle of the climax where the timpani has this 
ba 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 rhythm. Oh uh, yeah, there it is. Listen yeah. to that. It, 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 it's really amazing. But you know the, one story about about um, timpani or, or percussion. Did you know the story that um, the Bayerische Rundfunk was on a Japan tour and the maestro Jansons decided to make another a Wagner encore uh, on the last show. So they flew in another percussionist just bef because uh, in this encore uh, there's a a, a, a symbol, uh -huh. yeah. And so he went on stage just only for the encore um, and missed his entrance. But he had a wonderful night in Japan. <laughs> Lovely food, you know. It was, but he. It, just, it was just only this one, and he just stood it's all up. All he had to do, and uh, too late. Right. <laughs> one job, and yeah. There's a, there's a Gary Larson cartoon of a cymbal player standing there, but he's only holding one, cymbal, and he says, "I'm not going to blow it. I'm not going to blow it. I'm not going to blow it." And, <laughs> All right, we have to wrap this up, but quick question then, since we're on that subject. Bruckner 7, slow movement, symbol crash or not? Um, yes. Okay, I agree. <laughs> Clement Schuld, our wonderful conductor, making his Oregon Symphony debut tonight. I think we're all in for something special. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Dry bread, I love it. Yeah.